Okay, welcome to uh, CS4510. I think this is uh, 6-2. So the topic of today's lecture is going to be something called Turing completeness. What that basically means is we're going to have like an unlimited number of these different kinds of computers and we're going to show that they're all equivalent to a uh, Turing machine. So here's the definition of Turing completeness for uh, M any kind of I'll call it a computational model we say that uh, M is uh, Turing complete if uh, the languages decided by a Turing machine are a subset of the languages decided by M. So basically what we do is we simulate a Turing machine on our on this computational model and then by the church uh, Turing thesis, so recall uh, by uh, church Turing thesis uh, for all M, it's true that uh, the languages decided by this machine are sim can be simulated on uh, the Turing machine. Right. So applying these together, we get that this machine is then equivalent in power to a Turing machine. And then uh, that means it's Turing complete. It's like the same as a Turing machine. We don't have to use a Turing machine in the proof. We could use any other uh, computational model that we might have also already proved is Turing complete. Right. So the first uh, computer I'm going to give you that we're going to prove is Turing complete is a Turing machine with a two-way tape. So uh, I call it theorem. Uh, two-way uh, infinite uh, tape uh, Turing machine is a uh, Turing complete. So first of all, this might be easy. What we're going to do is simulate a one a one-way infinite tape Turing machine on a two-way infinite tape Turing machine. And you think, well, I just don't use all the tape. Easy. And you're right. But I'm going to give you a more explicit construction just, you know, uh, as a, a, a good exercise in rigor. So, right, so recall a one uh, a, a Turing machine has a tape that looks like, uh, it starts like this, and it goes here, right? It's got a bunch of cells, and it goes off into infinity that way. But then a two-way tape, a two-way... TM, I'm just going to say it looks like, well, I won't draw the ends, but there's something like this, and it goes off in infinity in both directions. Something I never discussed, actually, is what happens if you're at this cell, and you move left. So what happens is you just stay in the same cell. That's it, right? So if you try and move left here, you just stay. So what I'm going to do is... Uh, for any, I'll call it a, a one-way TM, define an equivalent two-way TM as follows. So what we're going to do is uh, we're going to make, I'll call it, uh, sigma, uh, excuse me, gamma 2 is going to take on gamma 1, but then we're going to union it with a special symbol, which I will choose to be the question mark, because I've already used hash. So that, then everything else you copy the same, uh, except for delta. And I'm going to say uh, to each state, uh, add... Uh, the self loop loop uh, if you read in the question mark uh, that means you went past uh, the the side we're going to put this question mark on uh, so I want you to uh, write back the question mark and then move right 
And so this transition should be as a self loop. And then uh, instead of initial initializing the tape with W to run some Turing machine on W, we're going to initialize with uh, question mark uh, W. So what's going to happen here is we're going to have our sort of like tape like this, right? I'm going to put this question mark in the cell. And then I'm going to put the word, the W here, right? So basically, then the, the head of the of the thing is going to start here, and then we're going to just do our proper math. But in the case that the Turing machine did have a transition where it was like, I'm going here, and it expected to hit the wall as if it was a one-way infinite tape, we just immediately see the question mark, and then we have to transfer back. All right. So this Turing machine might take extra set steps than uh, for the two-way infinite tape to simulate the one-way, but it still simulates it perfectly fine. All right. Therefore... Uh, then this 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 implies that the the two uh, I'll just say two TM is a subset of the uh, no excuse me the that the uh, the Turing machines are then a subset of the uh, two way infinite tape TMs right and then by the Church Turing thesis a two way infinite tape is then equivalent to a uh, one way infinite tape okay for our another um computational model let's consider uh unrestricted uh grammars these are exactly what they sound like they're uh let's see v sigma p and then the start symbol such that uh it's, it's the same as a grammar but uh, uh, productions in, uh, P are of the form, uh, Sigma union V, uh, two Sigma union V, uh, union epsilon. Right. So basically, if you recall on a context-free grammar, this was only V. Oh, excuse me, it's sigma union V star, sigma union V star. So this was only just V. You had one non-terminal on the left-hand side to a string of terminals and non-terminals. An unrestricted grammar has uh, any string of terminals and non-terminals to any string of terminals and non-terminals. And this turns out is Turing complete. You could make uh, unrestricted grammars for like zero to the two to the n and all kinds of things. But uh, let's prove it's Turing complete. So what we're going to do is uh, this is actually quite tricky at first guess, but we're going to use the fact that Turing machines can have configuration. So if we're at configuration, you can think of the configuration like a string rewriting, right? Which is sort of what this unrestricted grammar is. So if we're at configuration, say A, B, Q, I, C, D, and this yields, uh, I'll say yields, uh, A, B, E, Q, J, D. So that was the rule. Uh, read C. That was the rule. Right. Q, I times C uh, takes us to, uh, well, I'll write it like this. Uh, the delta takes, uh, we're at Q, I. And we and we read tape symbol C, uh, then this is going to contain right. So it's supposed to be Q uh, gamma oops, Q gamma 
and then uh, left or right, right. So this is the same as uh, we move to QJ, uh, wrote E, which could possibly be equal to C, and then moved right, right. So that's how this uh, uh, thing works. But what we can do is we can come up with uh, the translation. So we can say P uh, contains uh, production. So we're going to replace uh, this string with this string. So we're going to say Q, I, C to uh, E, Q, J. Right. So just to elaborate the other parts, uh, we need V, sigma P, S. Sigma is the same. Uh, v is equal to Q, I. We'll just say, we'll just call it Q. Um, but the productions are going to contain things like this. And then let's do the left-hand one as well. So if we went like A, B, Q, I, C, D, and let's say we, we wrote an E, we move left. Let's say we went to A, Q, J, B, E, D. What we have to do is replace B, C, D with Q, J, B, E. So we would contain the production... Uh, and it's for all B, but C and C and E would be uh, fixed because that's what we're reading it. So we'd say Q zero Q I C goes to Q J Q J uh, zero E or one Q I C goes to Q Q J one E. Right. So then we're at the end if we need to have the string on the tape, right? Not uh, not with this non-terminal in it. So we would, what we would also say is that the QA goes to an empty string. Uh, we need the start symbol, right? So. And then we have the production S goes to uh, Q0, which is the, which is the start symbol of the so the start on terminal produces this the start symbol of the uh, Turing machine, and then we go to A, and then uh, we have the rule A produces you know sigma star so zero A, one uh, A, or epsilon. So uh, what's happened is A is going to produce some string fully out, and then we're going to uh, start iterating through uh, the configurations from the starting configuration to the ending configuration. And then for the end of configuration, then we hit this QA, and then we immediately accept, right? I guess I also need a QA, uh, an A here, right? So uh, this this will produce this will accept any string that the Turing machine will accept. It's kind of a kind of a very a beautiful argument if you think about it. We went from like regular grammars, which were accepted regular languages, then we went to context-free grammars by only unrestricting one side, the right-hand side, and then we went to another level. So it's it's sort of like a Dante's Inferno kind of thing. We were going through these stages that are set containment and very strict. And if we just have no rules, we have no restrictions. It turns out we're Turing complete. We can't get we can't really get anything more uh, powerful. In terms of grammars than this, what we, we could do is allow uh, epsilon here, and it turns out that's that's called something else, but that's also Turing complete. It turns out. So, uh, I'm just this, by the way, today's lecture is all I'm going to be doing is just coming up with several models of computation and just proving that they're all uh, Turing complete. So let's uh, do uh, another one. Let's do uh, PDAs. So let's say. Uh, let uh, two uh, PDA or I'll just shorten it two PDA B uh, PDA with uh, two stacks. Basically, what we do is uh we can push or pop to both at the same time, 
Right. I could say, well, maybe we have one pointer head and then we move to the left one and then we push or pop. We move to the right one, we push or pop. Doesn't matter. Uh, it turns out, by the way, this is uh, two PDA is uh, Turing complete. This is a very interesting problem. So before I continue, I want you to pause the video and I want you to try and think about what the solution is before going on. How am I going to simulate a Turing machine on two stacks? So just think for one second. Okay, the answer is we're going to again take the configurations and then just simulate the tape on two stacks. So if we so the two stacks, we're just gonna like if this is stack one and this is stack two, we're just going to like connect them like this, and it's gonna be like a tape. It's gonna like a two way, uh, uh, like a two way infinite tape. So and when we move left, we're going to pop off one and push to the other. And when we move right, we're going to pop off one and push to the other. So that's basically the whole idea. Right? Let's formalize it now. The first thing is that a PDA has input while the Turing machine, our model, really, we're writing the input to the tape and then iterating over the tape. So first step I'm going to say is uh, push all of uh, input to the uh, right stack. So what that's going to look like is with if, if let's say we let's say input uh, was a zero one let's say zero one zero, um, then this is going to look like uh, we have the left stack and we have the right stack. So we're going to push zero one zero in. We're going it's going to look like that. So, uh, if the Turing machine, let's say if we're at state QI and we read an A and we go to QJ, uh, we write a B and we move, let's suppose we move right. So let's say we're moving, this is like what we're reading currently, this is the head. So if we move right, we need to push, pop from here and push here. So what I'm going to say is pop uh, A from right stack and then in a single operation we're still we're going to push uh, B to a uh, left stack so what that means is let's say if we were going to uh, move uh, right here we're going to say we're going to go from, I'll write it like this. We'll go from, uh, uh, we'll go from like A, B, C, and that's going to take us to, uh, B, uh, B, C, right? So the left move is, is basically done the same. Let's say we, uh, arrive at, uh, Q, J. We, we wrote B, and, but we moved left after coming from QI uh, reading A. So what that means is the top of the stack is going to have some, let's just say this is a B, let's say this is an A, and let's say this is a C. What we're going to do is we read this A, so we're going to pop it off this stack. Uh, we're going to pop it off uh, this stack and then just push back the same uh, thing then we're going to pop this off and push it in so we're going to say uh, pop a off a uh, right uh, stack uh, push a b to a uh, right stack uh, pop a uh, any top of the stack. So I'll say, I'll say sigma off uh, left stack and push a same onto a right uh, stack. So what this is, is really, it's, it takes a, a, an extra step, but this is like, 
going to get us to uh, something. First, we're going to pop A off and push B on the right side. So it's going to be like B, uh, B, uh, C. And then this is going to get us to like uh, nothing uh, B, B, C. All right, so it's sort of like we're simulating the two-way tape on, on the double PDA. Should be obvious, right? It, it's a very interesting problem to me because it's like it's a, you would think that the part of the uh, restriction of a PDA is the fact that you have trouble reading, but it turns out if you can just sort of store the things that you pop off the stack, it ends up being Turing complete. It's a good demonstration why Turing completeness is you just basically need the bare minimum of a computer. If you come up with a computer right now yourself, there's a very good chance that it's going to be Turing complete. It's almost, you almost need nothing to be Turing complete. So, uh, as a corollary, can I spell corollary? Let's see. As a corollary, a 3 PDA uh, is a subset of uh, language is decided by the two PDA right so technically you could simulate a three PDA on a two PDA how would that work you convert the three PDA you convert the three PDA to a Turing machine by the church Turing thesis there's some way to do it then you simulate the Turing machine on the two PDA using this method so it sounds really messy and probably is but Past two stacks, you don't get anything. So any K, so I can even just say here, I'll just say K PDA, K is greater than or equal to three. It's equivalent, actually I can even say two, right? and then it's trivial, but no matter how many stacks we had past that, it's just, it just gives us a uh, same thing. So that's a very, very uh, interesting problem. And you can think of a zero PDA then as like an NFA, right? Oh, something I forgot to mention is that the, we copy uh, the states as normal in the uh, Turing machine. Okay, now let's do a multi-tape Turing machine. So, uh, multi-tape. I'll write it this way. No, I'll write it. I'll write it. Uh, a multi-tape uh, T uh, Turing machine is uh, just a multi, I mean, it has several tapes. So what we're going to say is that the transition function uh, delta is going to take uh, the same states, but then at each step, it's going to uh, be able to write, uh, it's going to read, uh, let's say, k uh, symbols, and then it's going to move to a new state. It's going to write k symbols, and then at each, uh, at each uh, tape, it's going to have a different head. So it's going to move left or right on each tape individually. Right. So, so, so obviously that a Turing machine can be simulated on a multi-tape Turing machine by ignoring all the tapes. You just say, oh, I'm not going to use those. I'll say, I'll say KTM. And you could say, well, the obvious should be true by the church Turing thesis. But I'm going to give you the construction again, like uh, as more evidence for the church Turing thesis, right? So what I'm going to do is simulate a K uh, tape TM on a multi tape uh, TM. So, oh, excuse me, not a multi tape on a on a on a TM, just a normal Turing machine. So basically, what we're gonna do is we're just gonna keep each tape does have a lot of stuff on it, but they're all the whole tape is not being used. It's technically finite, so we're just gonna like concatenate them. So we're gonna say uh, let uh, sigma is gonna be equal to if sigma was zero one. Let's just call it uh, so zero one uh, zero with a dot one with the dot and then a pound sign All right so what we have here is we have quote unquote a specially marked symbol so you can think of if a turing machine re reads a zero and then writes a zero mark that's equivalent to it like marking the symbol 
right? We can just do that by uh, having this uh, connotation in the alphabet. So if the machine has, let's say it has like three tapes, right? This is a big, ugly computer. Let's say there's like a tape like that. There's a tape like that. And there's a tape like that. And then this has like, I don't know, let's say uh, uh, zero, one, zero, or one, one. Uh, let's do a space. Let's do space. Uh, excuse me, this should actually be the gamma. Right. Uh, one, or let's say zero, one, one, something, right? And let's say the heads go, I don't know, here, here, and let's say here for fun. Uh, so then the single tape TM is going to look like what we're going to do is use this, this symbol to split up the tape, right? So it's going to be the first tape. Well, let's just, let's just include a pound sign to, to begin with. Then we're going to have, uh, zero marked one zero pound. I might need some more room. Uh, one one marked space so one one marked it looks like an i uh space uh one pound and then uh zero one uh one marked right and then the head can be whatever but this is how you would simulate the uh, k tape turing machine on a turing machine you could also just say by church Turing thesis, but this is to give you some more, uh, some more convincing arguments about why these models are all Turing complete. So now let's do some of the mo one of the more interesting ones. Uh, uh, NTM is a non-deterministic. A Turing machine. Turns out this is equivalent to a deterministic Turing machine. If you recall from D DFAs even, it was not obvious that uh, non-determinism gave us any power. And eventually we were able to prove that we could simulate an NFA on a DFA at the cost of exponential blow up in space uh, in the number of states. But here we have a similar idea. We're going to simulate a non-deterministic Turing machine on a multi-tape Turing machine, and then we can apply the simulation of a multi-tape Turing machine to a Turing machine. So we're going to go like uh, NTM to uh, KTM to TM, and that's going to prove that the non-deterministic Turing machine is a subset of the Turing machine. Right? That'll show that non-determinism doesn't give us any power. Obviously, every deterministic Turing machine is a non-deterministic Turing machine. So that direction is done, but then the other, then the equality comes from uh, this way. So now let's prove it. So you can think of a non-deterministic computation like a tree, right? So if you have something that looks kind of like, uh, let's say we have like A, and then we have like A, uh, let's call this, Say this is a QI, this is QJ. What we can think of this is, is if we're at QI, we could go to either QI or to QJ, right? So we have some like structure to the tree uh, of the possible choices that we could take from QI. So what we're going to do is we're going to simulate uh, all these branches of the computation of the non-deterministic Turing machine. So we're going to say uh, design uh, 3TM uh, such that uh, we have like the box. So we have a tape, we have one tape, uh, two tapes, three tapes, such that uh, tape one only contains input. It's never uh, 
write written to besides the input it's only read from uh, tape 2 is our simulation tape is a simulation and uh, tape 3 keeps track of uh, where we are in the tree so we're basically going to do a graph search but here's the thing do we want bfs or dfs well you might think usually it doesn't matter but here we actually want bfs why imagine if we did dfs we would go down some very long path it's possible we would never halt right we want bfs so we can just check all computations that take uh, you know, if we do BFS up to depth K, what we're doing is all we're looking at every computation of K steps. So we're never going to miss an accepting uh, property, right? An, ex an accepting state. So to simulate, we copy tape one to tape tape two. We simulate that branch of computation, and then we accept if there is an accepting branch. And we use tape three to keep track of everything, right? So that's the, that's the whole idea behind simulating. Uh, a non-deterministic Turing machine on a uh, three-tape Turing machine, and then of course the three-tape Turing machine can be simulated on on a uh, on a one-tape Turing machine. So that 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 together implies that uh, the NFAs are equal. Well, I'll write it this way: the NFAs are equal in power to the Turing machine. Oh, NFA. The uh, the non-deterministic Turing machines can be simulated on a three tape Turing machine which we know can be simulated on a Turing machine and then obviously every not every deterministic Turing machine is uh, a non-deterministic Turing machine so these together uh, imply that uh, non-determinism gives us no power with respect to Turing machines So I hope today has given you some insight into uh, t uh, computers and uh, the church Turing thesis, right? So just a quick review, every Turing machine, if you can simulate the Turing machine on a computational model, then that computational model is Turing complete. The church Turing thesis says that model can always be simulated on the Turing machine. So today what I did is I did some simulations to give evidence for that, right? So you can simulate the uh, one-way infinite tape on the two-way infinite tape, right? So that's the that's the way we did that. Uh, we constructed a Turing machine for every uh, unrestricted grammar. So what this really showed was that the uh, languages by the unrestricted grammars, uh, the languages decidable by Turing machines are actually uh, simulatable by the unrestricted grammars, right? So this this implies that the unrestricted grammars are Turing complete because the other way follows from the church Turing thesis, right? So we simulated a Turing machine on a two-stack automata. So what that proves is that the uh, the languages decidable by the two PDA are a superset of the languages decidable by the Turing machine. And again, from the church Turing thesis, uh, we get equality. Then we simulated a multi-tape Turing machine on a single tape Turing machine, and then we then we use that to simulate a non-deterministic Turing machine on a Turing machine. So this is the kind of evidence that what I'm talking about the the empirical stuff that we see to give us a convincing idea that the uh, Church Turing thesis is true, it, even though it's not something that you can prove. To give you like a an application, you might see. Um, programming languages or other things called Turing complete, quote unquote. And a lot of times it doesn't really mean anything. Like if a programming language is Turing complete, that means you can simulate a Turing machine on it, but that doesn't really say anything. What it's used more colloquially is to mean that you can do anything in that language, right? There are languages which are not Turing complete. There are stack based languages, you know, low level things. Um, as another example, I, uh, there's a programming languages, there's a programming language called Solidity which is used in the uh, Ethereum blockchain. I TA for the blockchain course as well. So 
And that's, they advertised for a very long time that it was Turing complete because they had a Turing complete like syntax. It was kind of like JavaScript. But then it turns out at some very low level, it was actually not Turing complete. There was something that you couldn't do in it. Uh, so it was interesting that they were advertising it as that and it wasn't. Sometimes Turing complete, this, the, people say, you know, you can do loops in your programming language and it's Turing complete or whatever. You have access to memory or, you know, but this is what it, Turing completeness actually means. It means you can simulate the Turing machine in your computational model. Therefore, it's equivalent to a Turing machine. You could not simulate a Turing machine on a one PDA, right? You believe that. You could not simulate a uh, Turing machine on a TFA. Just as a, as a cute fun fact here, you can do this. If uh, TM, let's call it M, uses uh, finite space, so it uses uh, finite a finite amount of the tape, Uh, then here's something surprising. The language decided by M is regular. So you could I could also reward this as uh, the Turing machine uh, has restricted tape. It's a let's say it only has K uh, cells or something, right? So this is a sort of like deeper and shallower than it appears. So every computer has finite memory. Like my computer has so much RAM or whatever. Uh, the universe is finite. We all have, I have finitely many fingers. So isn't, shouldn't everything be regular then? Kind of, but it doesn't matter, right? Again, with the whole property training described where it is if you run out of paper, you can always go get more. That's pretty much true for anything you'll need to uh, ever need to do. The idea is if M is f the proof idea, I'm not going to prove it because it's like really pedantic and I don't care too much about the teach the details, but the proof idea is if M is finite, there's finitely many configurations, right? So there's, uh, if M uses only, let's say K cells maximum, uh, there are uh, only you know, finitely uh, many configurations how many it's going to be uh, so we have k cells so the configuration is going to be the k cells maximum plus uh, the extra symbol for the state so we're going to be it's going to be uh, sigma to the k times uh, q, right? Maximum. So it's finite. But and to each uh, to each correspond a state. So for each configuration, you give it a state. And then the transitions between the states are the possible transitions between the configurations. That's it. The accepting states are the ones where the state is accepting in the configuration. So that's it. Uh, so that's why this doesn't actually have any sort of deeper philosophical hoo-ha. It's because, you know, you have a huge number of possible states. Uh, so. Oh. I forgot uh, last time to give a quick biography of Alan Turing. Alan Turing, he solved this problem. Uh, we'll talk about it soon. And then uh, he went to work in World War II. Uh, he broke the Enigma machine. And it was a really, it's a really interesting problem. There's like this box with a bunch of gears and wires and buttons or whatever. And then... Uh, uh, he helped break it. It was really it's a, if if you study the Indic machine today, it's actually a very difficult problem. It's, it's really nice that he solved it. And then he was gay, and someone broke into his house, and then that's how he found out he, people found out he was gay. And then the government had him like chemically castrated, and then he may or may not have committed suicide really young. Uh, it's kind of unclear. There was a machine in his house that made some smoke or something, but 
or maybe he killed himself. It's a really tragic story. Um, they made a movie about him, about his fake wife, the called the Imitation Game. Some like famous actors and stuff. He's a very popular figure in, in in popular science. He's on the I think he's on the British Money, whatever they use. So he he's he's far more interesting than uh, Alonzo Church. So okay.